Okay, so hello everybody. My name is Chris Gorski and I am a co-founder of APS. And I have a great pleasure to welcome uh, tonight, Robert Babich, who has agreed graciously to talk to us. And uh, Robert has been a user of APS products for quite some time. He is a Polish born but German uh, composer and pro music producer living in Malta right now. And he has an amazing, um, well, obviously an amazing uh, history. He's been doing it for a very long time. Uh, one of the things that really interested me in his resume was also that his gift of synesthesia, which is uh, seeing colors uh, with music, which I would ask uh, him about a little bit to explain to us what that is. But uh, also he has been producing music for such a long time. He has developed his own very particular style. And this is mainly what we would like to talk about today and um, see what uh, makes him tick in his music production. Over to you, Robert. Yes, so thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here with you in this beautiful online world, straight from Malta. So I'm open to any questions you have. Everything, anything you want to know, just ask me. All right, thanks. Uh, well, I think, uh, I guess the first thing I would like to ask you is how you started. How did it happen that you, you know, you got into music and, and music production? Okay, the, that's, um, okay, let me start from the super, super beginning. <laughs> um, I, I had my first experiments with a Commodore C64 and then Commodore Amiga home computer. There were at a, there were programs called Tracker where you had four lines of uh, mono samples of a few seconds. <laughs> and I was experimenting with this, but I never thought I will do anything in music at all. And then around, 1990, 90, 91, I'm not so sure anymore. It's way, way too long ago. Um, I, I, a friend of mine um, borrowed me some instruments and I had the opportunity to play around with instruments at, that I didn't knew at that time. I mean, I had no clue anyway of any music. Uh, so no musical education, but I got a drum computer, a monophonic synthesizer, and I can show it which synthesizer it was. This one. <laughs> you see, it's now this one is mine and it's very fucked up. <laughs> it's been in use for a long time. Yes, the TV303. Um, so basically I had a, yeah, a little bit of equipment, um, a, D, a really cheap DJ mixer and, um, a, and the only thing I, where I could re record what I was doing was on a cassette. <laughs> and the funny thing is, um, because I only had a DJ mixer and not a studio mixer, there was no panning because a DJ mixer is always stereo. So the only way you could insert all the instruments were by putting the mixer in mono. <laughs> then you had everything in the middle. <laughs> and by accident, I, um, I put this one in the phono input of the DJ mixer. <laughs> All and right. the people who still know knows then if you put a line signal into the um, um, a phono input, it will distort <laughs> really, really hard. But I liked it. <laughs> the way how it was distorting 
was amazing. Um, and I thought, okay, let's let's keep it like that way. And um, yeah, in the end, I think I recorded maybe 10, 12 tracks on a cassette. Okay. <clears throat> and I saw an advertising in a music magazine. Uh, at that time, techno was really just starting. I mean, it was the beginning of techno in Germany. And I saw an advertising that they, um, a young electronic music label is searching for beginner artists or whatever. <laughs> and I took the cassette where I had the tracks and sent it in an envelope to this label. And then a few days later, I got a call. <laughs> hey, this is fantastic. We want to release this. This is perfect. Please give us the master. We will make a, a great uh, release out of this. And I told him, hey, you have the master in your hands. That's the only thing I have from all this music. I mean, if you if you think about it, totally crazy. The only recording I ever had of my music was sent out to the first record company. Uh, yeah, but I was I was happy, and and uh, this was my first uh, vinyl. So that's that was quite a quick and uh, sudden start to your career. Yeah, and and the thing is, I'm coming from a well, let's say very unmusical family, <laughs> so music okay. had no real value somehow. And um, I was still at high school at that time. And for my parents, the only thing was important, boy, you do high school and then maybe you go to university and you will be in future. We seem to have a bit of a Break an engineer, in. yeah. I it, it, it you got cut off. Ah, okay. I think the last thing I I heard was uh, your expect your parents' expectations towards yeah. your career. Ah, okay. So my yeah, my parents expected that, yeah, I will be an engineer or something, have a real job, like normal people. <laughs> yes, but, musician musician <laughs> isn't the job, right? No, it's it's not the job at all. And then uh, I think two months after my first record came out or my second, I'm not sure anymore. Really, I'm not sure anymore. Uh, two months, I think like two months later, I got a call from a, from, a, from a promoter in Cologne in my city where I was living. He found out my number through some people and he, he asked me, um, if I want to play a live set tonight, because he his other act that should come from Holland is not able and he needs a replacement as fast as possible. <laughs> so I never been on a stage before in my life. I said, yes, of course I come. <laughs> and then I, 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 I told him um, I have a, one little problem uh, and he asked me what what problem I said I don't have any instruments <laughs> because they were borrowed they were not mine and he said don't worry we, we will get something and I told him okay I need a drum machine I need a synthesizer and maybe an effect or something and a, a mixer and then yes I, I got there uh, there was equipment I never saw <laughs> in my life before but uh, I was so hot, I wanted to do this. So I, I, I found out how the things worked, programmed patterns and played one hour straight improvised techno. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Sounds like um, it's uh, always in the career of, of musicians, especially those who had a really long and successful one, uh, people say that they got lucky, but but somehow I have a feeling that it goes together with um, 
well, talent, obviously, to start with, but also the kind of tenacity and readiness. As you said, you were you had no experience, but that didn't stop you, right, from, from saying, of mm. course, I'll do it. Yeah, it was not important to be perfect or anything. Just the experience itself was the thing I was after. And, and, right. and, and really, um, at that time, I was a very, very shy guy. So uh, even just in the school, staying in front and speaking about something was like horrible. And imagining me on the stage <laughs> in front of many people was like un unthinkable. And, and, and that's one, one of the funny things is that during like, it, it, it came quite fast that people were inviting me and I was able to buy like my first equipment and, and got more and more shows. And quite often in the first few years, people came to me and told me, man, you make such amazing music, but please smile once, <laughs> please smile at us. So it looks like you've learned the trick. I, I had to learn it, yeah, because I, I, I took it, yeah, personal that, okay, I have to learn to smile a bit. Do you, um, uh, well, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about this uh, synesthesia thing that I've uh, read about? What, how does yeah. this work for you? And did you know, did you know that from an early age that you had something um, like that? Actually, I found out that uh, not everyone has this quite late. Because for me, it was normal that everything I hear uh, have like in when I when I'm closing my eyes, I see kind of geometric forms with colors. Uh, I would say um, when I describe music for me it's it's a sculpture in time it's like a frequency sculpture and and emotions are into into like part of the structure it's you don't have i don't have real words for this does this um, does this enter into your workflow does this help you or does this accompany you just as a kind of a side effect in your music production what what, what place does it have I think uh, it's helping me in that way that I'm Okay, we, it looks like we have um... Okay, again. I think it cut off again. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Can we go back to that? Yeah. Okay, so to the if synesthesia has any <laughs> Again, okay, um, I think it helps me to be fast at the studio because um, like um, in the arrangement and in the mix down, for me, the, when things are not right, I, I immediately see them. And, and that means that, um, yeah, I, I work really fast. Usually I do one or two songs per day. Mostly wow, everything I have, mostly everything I have done in, in all those years was done in one day, and that's why I have this crazy amount of oh, one thousand tracks. <laughs> wow, oh, that's amazing! This is just crazy. <laughs> and uh, it looks like you you use a lot of gear to do that too. I mean, I've been I've seen a few pictures yeah. of the studio. Yeah, if, if um, a little bit, if I show you a little bit around. Um, later, maybe I, I can show you a bit. Um, I would say um, I, I like gear, but it's not a must have thing. It's more of a, it, it helps me to be fast and I know exactly what I have to do to find the sound I need. Okay, but how does this uh, um, how does this work? I mean, for example, if you're starting with a song, with a 
mm -hmm. for the piece? Does it start always from with a beat, with a melody, with a idea for chords, or does it change every time? Okay, um, there, there I have to be a bit more um, philosophical, I think. <laughs> I have my own kind of concept. Um, I, I start with an inner, okay, I start with a kind of an inner story or inner feeling. And then I, when I, when I, I, I work with uh, Logic Pro as my software, and I really like Logic or is this kind of DAWs because you have an empty screen. And for me, this empty screen is like an empty theater stage. And every sound or element is, is a figure and um, it's like a person or I use decoration material. <laughs> and then I create little stories. And for me, like a song needs to be a, a story. It's, it's like one scene in a, in, a, in a movie, exactly one scene with one topic. One guy is asking another guy, have you seen this amazing plane in the sky? <laughs> and then the other guy answered, yes, I saw it and it was wonderful. And that could be a song. <laughs> okay. I mean, something like that. So there is a kind of a narrative part. You yes. narrate a story, you tell a story from, from A to Z. I, I would when when I try to explain what I'm doing, I'm I'm always telling the people that I'm a storyteller. In a way, I'm I'm telling stories with sounds, and oh. and <clears throat> when I'm creating all these songs, I have this in my mind that I have all these little scenes, and then when I'm playing a live set, when I'm on the stage, I can put all the scenes together to a big long <laughs> epic story and take the people on a long journey sounds wonderful uh is um at any point of your work um is the technical side any more important or is it just a natural thing that you do without thinking you grab an eq a compressor uh, more as an artistic choice rather than thinking, oh, I have this frequency and I need to work on or the dynamics of a given kick is too much or something. How does this work for you, the use of, of actual tools? Um, for me, personally, um, I even when I'm using EQ, I never look on the numbers at all. Like never, before, like from my personal point of view, the EQs could be like without <laughs> any text. I mean, it, it's 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 okay because um, I, I I use my ears. Sounds like a great advice to everybody, <laughs> because we are so used to the visual feedback of. Um, plugins for example yeah working inside the door that uh, sometimes we may have a tendency to to actually look at the music more than actually hear it but that's that's a a, a point here that um on hardware EQs, it's easy because you can touch them and you feel how they go through the sound on a plug-in i really don't like this emulated hardware um things there is something like a, a modern eq like uh, uh, um, i mean uh, something like the uh, it's, I mean, typical something um, a graphical eq where I just take frequencies and grab them makes more sense i mean you know, rather than, rather the, than emulate an SSL or an Eve. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I mean, I 
I love all these EQs because they have a di different texture. They do something in their own way. But most of the stuff that I'm using, like I have a big collection of microphone preamps and I'm not working with any <laughs> microphones at all. I mean, yes, sometimes for vocals, but I'm not using microphones. I'm, I, I use all this different, um, let me show you because that's what we can. We can show things. Um, here are some of the preamps. I sent the line signals, the audio through the preamps okay. just be, uh, because of the texture they are adding to. Right, so like a painting, so to yeah. speak. They, they helped me to get this this fine little color mm -hmm. shadows. <laughs> and at the same time, they also compress in a way, if you go a bit hotter in them. Do you so, do that? Do you do that often? Compress, yeah, I mean, yeah, going yeah. in hot, okay. Not too hot, but like just a little bit where you feel it's the music is changing, the, mm -hmm. the signal. And then you, I'm basically painting with all these different preamps, getting the signals together and um, and and paint the whole frequency range with different uh, sounds. And um, and then it's it's important to to have um, contrast mm -hmm. because when you work when when you work mainly with a computer all the plugins they come from one same place and somehow they will sound all the same perfect in, in their way like really great but everything sounds the same mm -hmm. this is a way to get all this soft because i'm using software as well i do love a lot of really cool plugins synthesized but to get them like in like you the feeling that you can touch the sound, mm -hmm. this is I'm getting through this uh, microphone preamps. And then now they slowly, the people create even um, emulations of this. So slowly we are able to get different kind of colors and you can choose how, like not only which synthesizer, but how the synthesizer what kind of character is coming from that? So, well, in order to judge this, obviously we have our brains and ears, but uh, we, we need the monitors, the speakers to um, yeah. uh, to show us what's there. And so we you can might... actually come to your beautiful <laughs> yellow. I don't know if it's, ye is it yellow or it's, golden? No, it's, it's yellow, it's acid yellow. <laughs> acid yellow, okay. It really is yellow on steroids. It's a lovely yeah. pair of coax. My, I have, as you can see, uh, a pair of uh, military green, <laughs> much less enticing, but uh, hopefully they sound the same. And so, well, could you tell us a little bit about the way you monitor? Do you have like special mm -hmm. things you do, like levels and uh, different monitors for different things? What do you use the coax for, for example? Oh, um, I have two systems. One is the main full range speaker. And then I have a, uh, um, this one, a monitor controller. Well, um, the music is going there and I can switch between the monitors at just a, a touch. And basically both moni both speaker systems are in the same loudness. So if I'm switching, I'm just changing the frequency contest and the window I'm looking on the picture. It's not like different levels. That's important for me because when I'm switching, it's just, oh, uh, okay, the window is getting a bit smaller here and here and here, but at the same time, I have a more focus. So that means that my big system is showing me everything and you can get lost in everything. <laughs> so it's, it's really cool to have my little yellow devil here <laughs> because first they 
they sound very accurate, but way smaller than, I don't have all this super low end bass and the super, I mean, it's a smaller picture, but very focused. So I'm using this on almost every, it's, it's, a, it's a constant thing that I'm switching uh, between the two systems because they give me different views. And this, this is really important that you have different views on how you look on the sound because you, you, you sit there and work on the music all day long. And when you, when you only have one focus, um, somehow you, you lose the ability to listen to the music. And that's why I also have some, some methods, let's call it tricks, <laughs> is what I'm listening to, the, to both speakers, yes. And then something that is really helping me on the APS especially is play the song and the lowest possible volume that you barely hear what's going on. And then you hear, you, you have a, you directly, you know, when something is in that really low volume, when something is coming up too hard, you know, oh, the, the balance of the elements is not right. Very often in um, making a film music, which I do, um, is it's the same trick we do. When we mix music to, to dialogue, which obviously is king in a film, uh, we make sure that uh, what you talk about works at low levels, that the music doesn't disturb. So it's uh, something we use too. In, and, in then, that and then uh, I call, and then something I call the toilet test. <laughs> <laughs> the toilet test is you play the song and you go to the toilet <laughs> and you sit down and listen from far away. Yeah. And this is, this is special because from far away, you, you are not hearing all this little detail work that you have done because we work on do on automation, doing this, 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 all this little thousands of little things but when you go away you only hear the basic structure of the song and if the song is still nice and you want to when you hear it on the toilet and you want to hear when you have the feeling oh i want to hear it more then you have done something right that reminds me of a legend uh, uh, that we had in France when I lived there about a sound engineer who would work in a big studio with big monitors, but he would mix on a mono speaker that was outside of the room and everybody would get freaked out. And at the end, he would just say, well, listen on the big speakers, you would go for a break and apparently everything would be perfect. So <laughs> it, it, it's true that I think changing the perspective and also what you were saying about the big monitors and the small monitors is really like taking a step back, right? like mm -hmm. like a painter who paints away and then he has to step back from the canvas to have a look at the totality of the picture yeah. mm. i'm wondering if um, because uh, i mentioned to you earlier that um, so many uh, there are so many um, videos and workshops and tutorials on on using those uh, on the technical skills that we need, obviously, the EQs and compressors. But mainly we should say that your uh, your studio is more or less uh, something rather rare. Most people um, produce uh, music out of their small studios and most of them use uh, virtual instruments. Uh, when you were talking about the uh, reamp, well, kind of reamping your, your synths with the, with the mic pre's, I also reminded myself of that story where on Michael Jackson, they would actually reamp the synths through speakers, the studio speakers. Oh, mm -hmm. So they would run them through, record them on microphones. I do that too. I, I run my synths through a, a, a Rhodes suitcase. It's a big, big speaker. Uh, so something I do. But also my question was, um, do you think... Um, we can like it's a question you know that i'm kind of representing this question uh, with this question the whole group of these people who work only in 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 uh in native you know like in, in inside the door without any hardware do you think you can make good sound 
with just this? Of course, yeah, no question. That there, there is no uh, analog versus digital anymore in 2020. It's more of a tasting or let's say a, a tactical thing because I I do like to use my hand. And every element in my song is played with my hands, mostly. And, and that means that, yeah, I like to touch things and do thing. I quite often I close my eyes while I'm recording something because it feels, yeah, I, I, it's, it's more intimate. And it would be difficult on the screen to close your eyes while you try to record something. I mean, yes, with MIDI controllers these days, yeah, of course, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's maybe because I'm doing music for such a long time and I was going through different periods of this technology thing. Of course, these days, it's amazing. I mean, if you compare it to what I had in the beginning, you start with a laptop and some programs and you will have access to billions of possibilities. Something you, that we never could imagine back then. What do you think about the offers like Arturia who offer all the emulated sense hardware sense? Is this mm -hmm. a good, I mean, is, has that got a future? I think it's, it's I use Arturia myself sometimes. Uh, some some synths uh, that I don't have, and uh, I want a special sound, and then I'm working on them. But the other way, it's it's a cool thought that if you get used to the synths like from Arturia, and then one day you are able to get the real thing <laughs> in front of you, you know how it works. You already learned. Okay, this synth needs to this this this. So. It's a good thing, and and um, I'm beside my own music and sound design work that I'm doing. I'm also a mastering engineer for quite a lot of people, and most of them are really computer only. Like these days, most producer really work in the box. I mean, in the last few years, something came up like this. <laughs> yeah, this crazy modular world started <laughs> and people, I don't know. I mean, back then guys were collecting um, cars. These days they collect modules. So uh, now more and more people have something to touch and experiment. It's, it's like Lego for sound. I mean, you put things together and have cables. Next one. I've started my uh, career in France in, in the 19s where everything was analog then mostly. Mm -hmm. And so I'm also very uh, used to knobs and I've been using Softube um, console one and fader one, which offer you the uh, possibility to touch your EQs and your compressors. And mm -hmm. I find also that doing that makes you not look at the numbers at all because you have them at your fingertips. And also makes me what you were saying about Arturia makes me think of um, why I love UAD and their plugins because uh, for educational purposes they are great because even even though they are not the real thing hundred percent maybe they are close enough so that when you get to a studio where you have a Fairchild or eleven seventy six or LA two you you know more or less how this sounds and what the knobs do so it is a great educational tool. Yeah, and something that was impossible before because it was such an exclusive club of people having access to these tools. And most of the little artists there were never had this opportunity to touch any of these really cool machines. And now everyone has them on, the, on, on their mouse. Exactly. Yeah, uh, well, the one thing we kind of not managed to emulate is the the monitoring. Back again to the speakers. I mean, you can monitor, you can you can emulate different, um, like uh, you know, like different uh, listening environments. There are some plugins that I've tried, which I haven't been really 
um, convinced by it. But, um, but my question is, do you only listen on your monitors to be sure that the mix is ready or do you check them somewhere else? Um, no, basically I'm trusting my monitors, but I think it's important because most of the people these days listen to music through this. <laughs> and at least on one point, if you have an important song or when I'm working, especially on an album or something, I really listen to the whole thing through the I, 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 iPods, yeah. iPods, uh, because that's the, the way how most of the people these days listen to music. Uh, that's also kind of um, made me think uh, about these things because I've I've never been a fan of in-ear um, uh, headphones. Mm -hmm. uh, I've uh, actually gone as far as uh, buying one that's actually you know molded to out of your ear, so I have one that fits my ears perfectly. But I've noticed that falling out all the time, so they fall out. And the thing is that the bass response is drastically different depending on how deep those things go in because obviously the the deeper you push them in the the, uh, the lower the bass response uh, and so i'm wondering um, also you know what's the point of spending all that much all that money on production if uh, if um, all you hear your music on is this pair of you know uh, 20 dollar headphones what do you think about that do you think it still matters uh, yeah like, especially because there's a, a way of consuming music through concerts or clubs. And there you hear the music on a full range system. And if you ever had the chance to listen to an own song on a big festival PA, you know what bass means. <laughs> I mean, and you have to control your bass because there you have the mix down needs to sit and it needs to be on point. So it's, it's important to hear what you're doing. And, um, and, and sometimes I try to explain this in a way that imagine the studio is, is, a, is your, let's say Ferrari car <laughs> and you, you want to go on a race like, you know, Formula One. But, and here's the point, you don't have windows. The windows are your speaker. And if you have really small or bad speaker, then you have only a small hole as a window where you are able to see your street. So you have an amazing car, you have so much power, but you are not able to see the street where you're going. And the better your monitoring, the clearer the window. So it's, it's, it's mo one of the most important things in the studio at all, your, your way, how you listen to the music. Um, so obviously uh, um, most of us realize that speakers sound quite different depending on where they are. The acoustics mm -hmm. of the room, the size of the room, the dimensions, the particular dimensions uh um, do have a lot of impact on that so what's your take on that and how do you did, did you treat your room in any way or how yeah does that work? um yeah my room is treated um um i had to because it's this, this one here in malta is quite big is i think uh, it was five meters and six or, or more no it's more it's way more down so it's really a big room here and I treated one like the front wall uh, have a lot of absorber so it's it's I'm just hearing what the speakers are doing and the back wall is so far away that anything that comes from the back you you would hear as a real echo so it's it's far away but it's important that you treat your room of course uh, yes, <laughs> very. Because then heard... you hear, I want to hear what's inside the music. I don't want to hear how the room sounds or how the speaker sounds. 
the speaker should be invisible. <laughs> I mean, in it, like the perfect speaker would be completely invisible. There, we don't have this at all, but it would be like a direct connection with your brain to <laughs> the interface. I heard that you also do teaching. Yeah. How does that work? Uh, what kind of, I, I mean, you know that we have uh, the coronavirus uh, yeah. at the moment situation, which means a lot of people uh, are looking towards online uh, mm -hmm. solutions. Do you do that too? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing this. I started um, a project with a friend together called Mastermind, uh, where we have like a closed Facebook group that people have access to. And then um, I do like videos and I do one-to-one -one teachings and uh, because I'm, I'm doing this, this mastering thing, I also helping people on their mixed downs or teaching them the ideas, how to work with things. I mean, I'm not so the, Quite often people ask me, okay, which frequency range is the perfect kick? And I don't have an answer for this. I mean, yeah, I know that it should be some, like the, the punch is somewhere around 100 maybe, I, but don't ask me this. It's, it's the, the, the important thing is that you feel it and, and things have a balance like everything works together and we don't forget the story that you want to tell. That's what, um, I mean, for me, music is, is a kind of a therapy for myself. Mm -hmm. And I am constantly speaking with my songs because they are these little stories and, and they have their own life. And I ask the song, what do you need? <laughs> To, to, what do you need to feel better? Mm. And that the song will tell me, ah, I, I want more bass. I want more of this element. Please bring me this. I want some reverb here. Just get in contact. So basically the, the what to me, um, what I'm hearing what, from what you're saying is that the production process is most important and the actual technical side, is not so much. I mean, yeah. it's important, but it's underlying the, the production and, and the production for me is feelings, is emotions, is uh, what you're going through when you're listening to the piece of music. Yeah, the, the people who listen to the songs, they don't care how things were done technically. I mean, it, it doesn't matter at all. The only thing matters is that you play it and you, you can feel it. And, and I mean, to be an artist is, is something I'm, I'm, I'm super thankful that I, in my kind of job, every emotion I have, I can be super sad, I can be happy, I can be angry. All these feelings make songs. <laughs> so right. however I feel, if I'm totally fucked up, if I'm super happy, if I'm crying, I can do a song out of this. Right. Amazing. It is. And I think I have a feeling that as long as we are humans, we keep, will keep on just making songs. I mean, it'll never stop. It's an expression of our human nature. Um, what Could you tell us a little bit, because I see we've been talking for 40 minutes, uh, so maybe we should maybe start, you know, maybe starting to close a little bit the whole the, the discussion if, if if you don't mind unless you have uh -huh. more stories but i would like to um ask you for the end um what is it you're working on now is there something you would like to share with us um, um during your latest i just um i just finished my next album and um i was working on this for three years <laughs> oh my god that's that's promising that means that I, and I, I told you before that I usually do a song per day, <laughs> but here I thought, okay, uh, let's change my concept because I have, I have a strong rule like myself, for myself is 
let me just explain that when I'm when I'm doing a song, I start in the morning and then I work through the song till like 6 p.m., 7 p.m. And then I do the mastering of the song afterwards. And then I do this kind of toilet test, listening to the song. I mean, I was listening to the song anyway, like hundreds of times, but like a final listen. And if I have the feeling that it's not really cool, but it's good, but no, 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 not really, I delete the song. The whole work that I have done gets deleted. Completely. <laughs> Completely. I'm and you start strict. from scratch. I'm super strict to this. And I start, and, I, and then the day is finished, and I start next day from scratch. How many times did you do that then? Thousands of times. You see, this is this is amazing. It actually leads me into this um, question I hear a lot about how long does it take? Well, it takes that many times, right? Now, you know, there's yeah. this story about Thomas Edison trying a thousand different solutions for his bulb to make it work until oh, 10,000, I think, 10,000 tries with different materials until he got it right. I don't know if it's true, but what you're saying is definitely ringing a bell in, in me that it really takes a lot of commitment and a lot of trashing, a lot of trashing along the way. Yeah, but this this way, um, you don't have unfinished songs. And many people have a lot of unfinished songs on their hard drive. And they will never finish them. <laughs> but they will always have this feeling, oh, I have so much to do. I have so much to finish. I have basically all the songs that I have, they were finished at that time, but maybe after a few weeks or months or sometimes, or when I was playing the song on my, because you, for me, it was like during the week, I work on music and on the weekends, I go for live shows. And then I was always playing the new tracks and testing them. And sometimes I had the feeling, oh, at home, it was like this, but on a stage, people had a different different way to contact to the song. So maybe I have to change something. So I go back and try to work on this, but that's not happening quite often. Okay, so uh, you said you finished the album, but it's not released, right? So when can yeah, we expect? It's, it's, um, it will be because of this crisis we are in will be released uh i think september but okay. um on on a label called systematic recordings uh from a friend of mine mark homeboy but i just when the the quarantine thing kept started uh i just closed everything and made 10 hours material of ambient music <laughs> nice <laughs> is that something you're going to share with us yes um uh, i thought because i had this idea for a long time that uh, i have two record labels myself yes. and always i loved just sounds and ambient music and i i thought okay now it's time to make this sub label just pure music just pure sound I don't care about the the whole um, club context at all. Just music you can listen to, you can close your eyes, you can go to bed, whatever you want. And so I will do an ambient label now. <laughs> uh, sounds great. I have quite a few people who, and including myself, who would be very interested. And. And it was the, the concept I had, like, I think two weeks before where I, when I started on this, I had this idea, every, like a track needs to be minimum one hour long. And uh, a, a total movement in sounds, but um, I don't want, at the same time that the music needs to be so calm that I don't want to be distracted. <laughs> So it's more of an um, like an atmosphere. You you give a room an atmosphere, and if you enter the room, you you feel like you are in another world. So it's 
interesting and yeah I, it, I will release the music well i'll be sure to nag you about it until you do <laughs> do it <laughs> um i have a question um hold on it slipped my mind just when you were talking about it ah yes i know tuning tuning mm -hmm. uh you know 432 440 444 uh, do you pay any attention to this? Do you use it? Do you change your tuning or do you stay always in the, at 440? Actually, just last week, um, I had a song that was 35 cents above 44 because I was not tuning my modular system. <laughs> okay. And then I had to tune. Uh, I was doing music and then uh, I had to tune all the software synths to this tuning. Yes. Um, yeah, when you work with analog, you, I, I'm, I'm tuned mostly by feeling somehow. I'm not this crazy, I'm not, I don't care about this accurate thing. I just, just for me, it's important. It feels right. The one, one, maybe one little thing I, because something I got quite new that is helping me right right now is, is this little thing here. Can you see it? Yeah, what is this? This this is called a theory board. And um, super amazing is it's basically a new concept of a keyboard where you have this side is, is the, um, is our chords. So you have the chord side, and here you have the, the the notes. So it's like an accordion. Yeah, kind of. But you you put in like which which um, yeah. Um, what's the word? Uh, which uh, the tone 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 tone. Um, which system you want to go like um but that's a midi controller right it's just yeah, a midi it's controller it's just okay. a midi controller and you can control everything out of this and i'm just i'm um experimenting right now with all this like uh, let's say um gypsy scales or some arabian scales stuff that I would never play myself, but this way I have access to this harmonic structures mm -hmm. and it's very interesting. Great. I'll check it out afterwards. Uh, and we'll, we'll be sure to post all the necessary links. Should you be interested in everything we talked about? And, also something um, uh, quite nice just um, for, for people who just use software. Yeah. I have to show this because it's yeah show, show please anything you care to show this one it's a, it's a knob ah and it looks very steampunky yeah yeah it's it's it it feels super nice and the thing behind this is you go with your mouse over a parameter you want to change and you can just touch this knob and okay. change the parameter Really? Anything you want anything. It works on anything on your screen, any slider, any knob. You touch, mm -hmm. you go with the mouse on this, and then you use your hand. Well, that sounds fantastic. Really. It's it's a very small little company from Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing. I mean, uh, this way you can do automation. On when I, I just today I was using this. Um, yeah, you, you go on, on your cutoff and just use your hand. I mean, or go in your EQ or even like the threshold of a compressor. And then it's it's it has an amazing um, fine resolution. So you can go really small steps. I'll be sure to check it out and I'll get the uh, link from you. And uh, yeah, I, can, I can send you the link. Uh, okay. So the helper are sometimes um, yeah, they, this. I like this little things some from people. All this, this are like small companies from people who are inventing 
stuff. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, I think we'll be closing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been wonderful having you with us, Robert. Uh, I've learned a lot, uh, and uh, and I think I'll be uh, I'll be looking very much forward to the next release of your next album. <laughs> Uh, we're very happy, of course, as APS, uh, to have you among our users and uh, your input's always been very valuable. And I'm sure that uh, everybody who's listened uh, has, you know, gleamed into, uh, into your ways of working, which has been very instructive for me too. So we'll be sure also to post links to your educational offers. And uh, well, I would like to thank you very much and thank everybody who is listening, looking, uh, watching the uh, live feed it's been a little bit hectic because uh, i can say it now just when i was getting ready to um, to invite robert i was uh, i put on some of his music on youtube uh, as background and i was already streaming um, i was already streaming so youtube uh, recognized robert's music as a violation and they closed our stream down so it's kind of funny <laughs> that we've been we've been duped by uh, by robert's own music so um, i'll be sure not to do that next time yeah, thank you very much <laughs> robert the artist for some unreleased music <laughs> yes exactly that's what we'll do next time thank yeah. you very much and i hope to see you soon thank you very bye much. <laughs> bye, bye.